Phil Van Truen, welcome to the Story Engine podcast. Thanks, Kyle. It's great to be on your show. I appreciate it. I am really excited to have you. We have a lot of experts and coaches and leaders, and you have made a career out of being a, a publisher or an author. And this is something that is really close to my heart after having authored several books myself. And so I'm excited to uh, dive into that with you today. But uh, as we get started, can you introduce yourself to the audience and tell us a little bit about who you are and how you're showing up in the world today? Sure. My name is Phil Van Truen. I am an entrepreneur and an author. Um, I've been a lot of things in my life, and I tend to sort of reinvent myself every decade or so, uh, depending on the circumstances. But um, I have been in um, online publishing um, and digital marketing for uh, 25 years. Um, started my own company in my basement, um, a DTC uh, e-commerce company, um, which uh, had some success and allowed me to um, take that on as my full-time career. Uh, it grew enough fast enough that um, we now have a, a warehouse and our own uh, employees. Um, and it's 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 something that's allowed me to uh, have the freedom to also um, explore and pursue something that I'm passionate about, which is writing. My undergraduate degree is in English and creative writing. Um, I had always written short stories and um, wanted to write novels and um, and children's books when I was younger. I sort of gave up that dream for 20 years or so, uh, published some short stories in literary magazines, but never made a whole lot of uh, never made a whole lot of money at it and um, had to uh, pursue a career to support my family doing other things. But over the last few years, I've regrouped. Um, I've published uh, three books now um, of my own, which I also uh, illustrate um, using Photoshop. And I've found a pretty big audience online to sell those books using a publishing company that I uh, launched myself. Um, so it, it's nothing that's going to make me rich or be able to solely support my family. But I'm really thankful for the fact that I've been able to come back to writing um, and that people are enjoying the, the stuff that I'm writing about, that they're buying these books. So I have another project coming up next year. It's called The Feather. It's a story that I wrote when I was 18 years old, and I'm currently working on illustrating that. And it'll probably take about six months to get all the illustrations done, but I'm, I'm very excited about it. What's deeply touching to me um, is I see a personal storyline of mine in yours when um, you mentioned probably before the call started that uh, you were a creative writing emphasis and when you were younger, you, you wanted to enter this. And as you've progressed through entrepreneurship and creating skills and creating value in the world, you've been able to become your own patron and create a space for that. And better yet, you're, you're able to, you're not influenced by um, purely economic desires. You don't need to make something that's absolutely going to sell or is, is going to work. And I think as a younger artist, it's, it's hard to toe that line. And for me, this happened with music in my late teens and early twenties. I played in bands. I wrote a bunch of songs and I credit a lot of what I do to those foundational skills that I learned, um, there. And over the course of uh, my 20s and my 30s, I've used it to create valuable skills and create a business for myself. But um, I, I, there was a part of me that, that had to let it go or that was putting a lot of pressure on myself. And I haven't created, I'm, I've been beginning to making the toeholds to being my own patron with music and investing in that. And that also includes writing and allowing my thoughts to expand. I spend a lot of time um, creating thoughts with other people. And so it's just personally inspiring to me to see what you've cultivated and created and made something valuable for yourself and uh, your your readers. Thank you. And I don't want to equate um, success with uh, with making money or, or selling your uh, your products. I especially when it comes to things like creative writing or, or 
creating music. Um, I think that regardless of whether I had figured out a way to, um, to, to sell my writing, I would still be writing. I, um, I, I've always uh, written in one form or another. Um, I just had given up on the idea of actually, you know, publishing it and, and, and having it be uh, ep- economically viable for me in a form of, uh, of making an income. But absolutely, selling your, your stuff is, is not a requirement for it having meaning for you or um, making your life more fulfilled at all. Mm-hmm. It's in knowing yourself well enough and knowing your value well enough that you can consistently make the space to create those things. I think it's a difficult and rare thing to have the depth of focus to immerse yourself in either a musical or creative or a video project. And you you have to be quite steely as an entrepreneur to resist the 10,000 other things that maybe you are supposed to be doing for the yeah, sake I, of, of this deeply valuable project. I agree. So tell us a little bit about uh, the, the publishing company you have, some of the books you've written, and, and really the, the messages that they contain or what, what you think is valuable within them. Sure. Uh, the, the company's called Stoic Simple. Um, you can see it at uh, stoicsimple.com. Um, it's sort of a meandering story how it, uh, how it started, but a few years ago I started learning about Stoic philosophy um, and I found so much fascination and, and personal development in it that I, I wanted to teach myself as much as I could about it. Um, and I started working on my own notes, my own uh, personal notebooks, um, just with, with I- ideas that stood out to me from ancient Stoic philosophers and modern Stoic philosophers. Um, I accumulated a lot of notes. Um, and at some point, I, I realized that uh, Stoic philosophy could easily be told and, and, and learned more, especially by myself, through uh, simple fables. And, and that's one way that I learn um, is through uh, v- very simple rewriting or, or creating simple fables or stories about certain lessons. And making those lessons simpler um, for me is, is an easy way to, to remember the information and, and really let it sink in. So I started uh, writing some short um, fables that incorporated lessons I had been learning from Stoic philosophy. Um, I ended up writing a, a few books, um, one called The Stock Horse and the Stable Cat. The next was called um, A Dog Who Follows Gladly. Um, and illustrating those books um, myself uh, in, in Photoshop, um, gradually, uh, I use a method that um, is laborious, takes a long time, but I'm, I'm able to uh, eventually rework these these illustrations that I create and make them look like oil paintings. And I put a lot of, uh, heartfelt effort into it. Um, and I, I launched a, my own publishing company. Um, I researched online exactly how to do it the right way. Um, I, I researched, um, you know, printers where to, where, what professional, uh, publishing companies use for printers, um, eventually found a, a, a printer that would work with me. And I, uh, I bought large uh, quantities of these books and, and sold them online, and it's, it's done fairly well. Um, my most recent book is called The Little Book of Stoic Quotes. Uh, you can find it on the website also. Um, it's a collection of um, 50 or so uh, Stoic uh, quotes from ancient Stoics like Marcus Aurelius and Seneca and Epictetus um, with illustrations uh, by myself and um, small um, vignettes or snippets of, of how to look at the quote to better your life. Um, and next year, um, hopefully if I stay on schedule, I'll have, uh, another book coming out called the feather that I'm illustrating now. And that was a book that I wrote when I was 18 years old and it was always close to my heart. And now that I have the illustrating skills to, um, give it the illustrations that it deserves, um, I'm putting a lot of work into that as well. I think that's, a really fun and fascinating project to revisit something from so many years ago and breathe new life into it. Tell us a little bit about the story. And then I'm also curious if after all of this time, you relate to what you wrote differently. 
Yeah, uh, that's those are great questions. The feather is a story about um, a feather that falls from an angel's wing in heaven. It's a it, it's a small, unremarkable feather where um, in its uh, native environment, and it's nobody notices when it uh, drifts away um, outside of the boundaries of heaven and down to the uh, to the mortal realm below. Um, and it makes a lot of miraculous changes uh, in the things that it encounters um, uh, on the earth, um, and likewise in the in the things that it encounters in the um, in the frightening realm uh, beneath the earth before it eventually is restored uh, back to its its place in heaven. And the story really um, isn't necessarily a religious one. It's uh, it's a story about how even a small amount of virtue um, can make a huge difference in the world, regardless of the kind of let's say darkness that that we're surrounded by surrounded by um, and coming back to the story you know more than you know, 30 years late after I had written it uh, looking at, at it through the lens of someone who's learned a lot about Stoic philosophy since then the message that it has about um, about virtue um, or excellence um, or let's say goodness uh, being able to change the world or your own circumstances in the face of any kind of hindrances or diversity is something that really struck me and I put it away in a drawer for many years and hadn't looked at it for quite a while and taking it out again I had assumed that it would need a lot of rewriting or uh, re-envisioning in order to be something that I would want to publish or, or to make it viable for anyone to want to buy and I was really amazed that reading it now, I, I, it still struck me as a terrific story. It didn't require much rewriting at all, uh, thematically, or even with the prose itself. Uh, I changed a few things here or there. I made it a little bit more applicable to some of the uh, lessons I'd learned from Stoic philosophy, but it, it still doesn't, it doesn't really focus on Stoic philosophy as much as my previous books had. So looking at something that I had written so long ago that I had assumed wasn't quite as good as I remembered it being, looking at it through a new lens, a new lens of somebody who has successfully published books now and sold more than 10,000 of them. Uh, it, it made me feel a lot better about myself and my efforts at the time. And it also made me want to relook at everything I had produced when I was younger that I thought wasn't worth a second look. So I'm excited going, going through this, uh, doing little rewrites, illustrating it which is taking a long time I've I, I think I've completed uh, six or seven of the 21 illustrations is that it's going to need but it's almost like communicating with myself over a gap of decades um, and working together with the person who I used to be to make this something that isn't better but that's a little bit more publishable and um, and appealing to an audience that I'll ultimately sell it to online. One of the key words you shared a couple of times is virtue. And perhaps the definition of this is your ability to change the world under any circumstance. But I'm curious what that word means to you as somebody who's studied a lot of philosophy. And I imagine there's some depth to that particular word. I'm glad you asked about that. That's the the word virtue is something that you see uh, ancient Stoic philosophers mention quite a bit, and it it sounds a bit antiquated to modern audiences, and it's sort of a loaded word uh, for people in modern society. It, it sort of smacks of religion or um, or uh, of of goodness or of uh, maybe a little bit sanctimonious those kind of things. Virtue when it comes to Stoic philosophy is something that was maybe translated uh, a little bit poorly um, from the original Greek. When Stoic philosophers spoke about virtue, I think a better translation is probably the word excellence. And by that, I mean um, excellence in, in all things we do or living up to our ultimate, um, living up to our, uh, our ultimate abilities as human beings to do the best that we can. Um, so being as wise as we can in all actions, um, being as just as we can, um, being as courageous as we can. And those, those forms of excellence all basically come from, from wisdom, as Socrates would say. They're all, they're all things that we can better through becoming more, more wise about ourselves and about the universe around us. 
So when, when we say virtue in Stoic philosophy, when you see ancient Stoics writing about virtue, it helps to replace that word with excellence and things start to fall into place a bit more easily. Uh, it's, it's easier to understand what they mean by virtue. So when I, when I say virtue, I, I mean excellence, but you can also have that mean goodness or, um, or, or courage in the face of uh, what you know is unjust. But look at the word as excellence. I hope that explains it a little bit. Yeah, yeah. it does. And um, <clears throat> I'm curious, I would like to go deeper and maybe there is, is a deeper thing, but uh, some of these are, it's, it's a lot of how we relate to ourselves. And I think there's, there's a deeper element of how we relate to the world around us. Um, and -hmm. I think some of it is if, how do you relate to the world? If you believe you can change it, which, um, is a, is a really unique philosophy that, uh, is, is uncomfortable for us to, to have a lot of the times it's much nicer or at least more comfortable to live in a world where we don't feel we can change it. But yeah, can you speak to more of how you see the world around you as well as how you're relating to yourself through these stoic philosophies? I can, uh, stoic philosophy has helped me, um, actually be more clear on appreciating the difference between the things I really can change and the things that I can't change and find being more accepting or being more accepting of the things that I can't change. Um, and finding ways to better myself or practice excellence in spite of that. There are things that we can change in the world. There are things that we can't. Um, unfor unfortunately, the, the vast majority of the things that we face in the world are things that we probably aren't going to be able to change. But the only really important things are those that we have total control over anyway. Um, things like um, our attitude, our judgments, our own opinions. And not many of us exercise the amount of control over those three things that we that we could it's tough to do it's tough to accept that there are things in the world that that aren't going to uh, change dependent upon your opinion about them it's tough to remain calm or accept things in a world that's changing in ways that you might not like personally but that doesn't mean that there aren't always going to be opportunities in every change even if you're under, uncomfortable with it to make yourself better and practice more ex excellence so in the end, it's taught me a lot more about appreciating how changes in the world, in spite of the fact that I can't do anything about them, can still make me a better person based on how I react to them and the actions that I take in the face of them. Does that make sense? It does make sense. And uh, that doesn't yeah. mean that we should, should, shouldn't try to change the world. I mean, ancient Stoics were not, uh, they certainly weren't people who, um, you know, would go up and sit on a mountaintop and not be involved in, in changing society at all. They strongly believe that if we could change the world, that we absolutely should. Uh, they, they strongly encourage that we get involved in our community and our, um, in, in politics and, um, in helping other people around us. Um, but that we, we should also ultimately accept the things that we, we really can't change about the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's a dangerous line, a very, a high risk, high reward line of being so unreasonable unre in the face of things that apparently can't be changed. And occasionally somebody changes it despite all of that. But this is also a generally good path. And and if you choose one place to to do that, then the rest of your life, you you uh, it would be healthy to have a balance if you're being so ambitious. It's a great way to look at it. Yeah. <clears throat> so some of the things that I'm gathering uh, are, are the theme, some of the three primary three themes between these books is appreciating the things uh, that we can and can't change, bringing excellence into all things we do, including our attitudes, judgments, and opinions on ourselves and on the world, which I, I feel like they, it's, there's not really a difference between them in some ways. And then um I, I guess this is the same thing, but being able to enact change in any circumstance, which I think is a little bit different in, between knowing the things that we can change, but no matter what situation you're in, no matter where you find yourself, there is a small action that you can take to move in, in a direction you desire if you so choose. 
That's a good that's that's a very good observation. And I, I would clarify that by saying, regardless of what circumstances you find yourself in, regardless of how the world is changing around you, there's always some way that you can use that situation to better yourself and practice excellence or virtue. Um, you know, or, you know, leading by example, showing people what a, a, a virtuous or, or or a wise person would do. Um, there's always some experience from changes, even if they're even if they're tough changes that can make us better. Mm. I like this. Now, with these cool. three ideas to uh, play a marketer game and to have our marketer hats, these are outcomes or promises or something that somebody would come away with uh, from your books. And so we could imagine that the opposite of these things are what they're experiencing before. So um, trying to change things that they can't, mm -hmm. which is a lot of it, energy and emotion. It is. Um, excellence in all things becomes... It's not excellence in none things, but uh, yeah, what what is it? It's hiding from our excellence, hiding from our truth. You said we're putting a marketing hat on. Yeah, I I, I would say if we apply this to uh, if we apply this to marketing, it's uh, I mean ultimately excellence in all things comes back to to wisdom, um, being as educated as you can be about how to do your job as a human being as well as possible. So, so uh, when it comes to marketing or entrepreneurship, I'd say that would mean making sure that you understand your job and that you focus on the things that you need to do and that you're as educated about them as possible. So does that help? Not, not quite the marketing hat I'm looking for. Okay. So I want to immerse us in the mind of, a, of somebody who would be a perfect reader for these books. And if the, the benefits of these books and the, the virtues of these books that we just described, if we go to the opposite polarity of what these virtues are, we identify the problems that somebody who would want to read your books is experiencing. Oh, and so um, in the first example, being able to appreciate the difference between the things I can and can't change becomes a problem in trying to change things that they can't, which is costing them energy and emotion. And right. um, the third one that we said, being able to change the world in any circumstance feels disempowered and disengaged from the world. Got it. And so excellence in all so you're things. You're, we, you're, you're basically making a persona. You're, you're saying a persona of, uh, of the customer or of the reader. Yeah. Yeah. We're Rather trying to got it. feel their experience. And so I'm, I'm curious now that we know the opposite polarities of two of these things, what is, how do we translate excellence into all things we do in, into a problem? Is it so a problem that the reader might have? Yeah, they're, they're well, not, I, I, how would they, how would they describe this? Well, everybody faces situations in, in everyday life, uh, where, where they might, uh, feel uncomfortable, helpless, or, or that there's no way, way for them to approach it without, um, without being a loser in some way. All right. And I, I, I believe that there is an opportunity regardless of the situation for you to practice excellence and, and get as much benefit out of it for yourself and other people as possible. There's opportunity in every single situation in our lives. Um, we might not and, want those situations to happen. It might be a, perf it, it might be something we don't prefer. Um, but there what are happens to us if we miss the opportunities. How do well, we, we feel? What do we experience? We, we, yeah. we miss most of them. That's part of learning. Uh, and we're also never going to reach a point where we can say, okay, I've, I've reached, uh, I've reached the pinnacle. I've finally done it. Uh, you're, you're not going to stop making mistakes. Um, but you can look back on those mistakes that you've made, learn from them, and hopefully apply those lessons to, to future similar situations. Um, but you're not going to stop making mistakes. Uh, if you only focus on the mistakes that you've made, you're, you're going to be completely immobile and, and, uh, and, and frozen. It's, it's not the right frame of mind. So what I'm hearing is excellence in all things we do 
as a problem is missing opportunities in life, feeling guilty about missing those opportunities and overcompensating in other ways because of it. It's a terrific way to put it. Awesome. <clears throat> I, ideally, I, I, I would like to strive myself and, and I would hope other people could learn to, to strive to, um, to not let themselves have time for guilt over past actions or for um, anxiety over uh, what the future might bring. A focus on how you can use this current situation as, as much as possible to make yourself a better person and to help the other people around you. And you, through throughout me knowing you, it, it seems like you've done very well at creating this spaciousness for yourself, for your business, and for your your family. But I think, uh, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, and oftentimes, uh, no matter who I work with in publishing or what whatever kind of creator or leader that I work with these the things that we create have a deep meaning to us and there's been either like a wounding or a time where we we didn't have access to all of these things that taught us the value of them and um this being able to share those moments in a strategic way that shows why we care about this in a way that speaks to that audience is is um a powerful way to reframe our own our own way we look at ourselves and our history as well um you put it and you put it well um i and i you say that i've done very well with it i to be honest with you i think that i think i i don't do very well with it but i know the things mm. that i need to change and that's one of the reasons that i that's one of the reasons that i I read about stoic philosophy is because these are, these are things almost like muscle memory that I need to consciously practice in order to make myself a better person. Um, I think that there are people who are naturally stoic thinking. And for those people, in a lot of cases, uh, when they hear about stoic philosophy and some of the exercises and um, strategies that it gives us, they'll say, well, that's common sense. And, and those people don't necessarily need to learn about these, uh, these strategies. But people like myself who aren't naturally stoic need to read about it and practice it a lot. Um, and basically, Kyle, basically stoicism is just early cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, it, it was a precursor mm -hmm. to cognitive behavioral therapy. I'm not sure if you know anything about that, but um, just like with cognitive behavioral therapy, these are things that you constantly have to practice if if you have a certain kind of personality. Um, so have I done well with it? I, I think I've done well in identifying how I need to be a better person. Um, and identifying strategies that help and that also can help other people. Um, but I don't know, I don't know if I would say I've, I've been successful with it completely in my own life yet, nor will I ever reach that. Well, anybody who would claim otherwise would not be worthy of trust. Thanks. And, um, <clears throat> and so I want to explore the, the darker side of this in a way. Uh, and I, I would love to find a moment in your history or in your past um, when when you were engaged with the the problem side of of this philosophy, a, a time in your life, maybe early in your business, where you were trying to change you things that you couldn't, and it was bleeding out a lot of your creative energy and emotion. You were disengaged from the world and feeling guilty about missing opportunities in life and trying to overcompensate in one area or another while life was kind of passing you by is there a specific time in your life that these words kind of call forth sure um i still fall back into that uh quite frequently to be honest with you yeah um, there are there are times in my life uh e even this year when i'll step away from reading about what i what i know helps me practicing uh strategies that I know help me and I fall back into um, old habits and old methods of thinking. So I don't have to reach that far back into my life to find examples of the situations that you're talking about right now. It's, it's not very hard to fall back into old habits, um, it, it, whether it's ways I deal with, uh, you know, um, bumps in the road with my business, which can cause a lot of anxiety. I mean, you, you know, you're a, you're a business owner, you're an entrepreneur. 
or ways with I, that I deal with uh, problems that I might have um, in my own family. Um, yeah. our, our natural human reactions, those uh, initial reactions that we have to things that sort of smack us in the face, let's say, um, are really hard to to overcome sometimes. And I fall back into those all the time. Yeah. Um, yeah. Phil, let me... One way that it's helped me is just... Hold on. Before we, go, we yeah, teach any more things, I'm, I'm looking for specific points in time rather than the lessons that we've extracted for this for the sake of um, crafting something that we could share about. Sure. Do, and do you want a specific example from being an entrepreneur or, or I something want that pre, focuses on, on my writing? Pre a, a time when you were in this pit before you had started Stoic Simple. Sure. So so not necessarily about my writing, but but something that helped me when you along were, the path of being able to become a... a when you author. were in the low point of one of these experiences, when you were in the darkness, in the struggle what was one of these struggles for you? I can give an example, a, a great yeah. example. Um, so I guess it must have been almost a decade ago now. I had the idea for um, the product or the company that, that ultimately was one, the one that allowed me to um, to quit my full-time job in digital marketing and, and pursue a career as an entrepreneur. And that, that grew into the... the um, the, the main company that I have now. Mm -hmm. And this idea I had, um, after researching it and putting a lot of work into a, a report for myself, um, I thought to myself, well, I, I, I wouldn't be able to do this. I'm just, I'm not a business person. I'm not an entrepreneur. I, I can't do something like this. And I, I put it away in a, a desk drawer somewhere. And it was a year before I came back to that idea, um, looked at it again and thought, you know what, I might as well try. Um, I, I, I might as well give this a try. I'm not going to have that many more chances to try something like this. And it ended up slowly but surely being something that um, that worked. And I do wish that I had tried that earlier when I first had the, the idea for it. Um, but who knows? If I hadn't, maybe it, it wouldn't have worked at the time. Is that is that a good... Is that That's kind of exactly what I'm for? talking about. That's no, I didn't I'm believe in myself at all. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> Let's see. What did you do for that year? What was, were you just digital marketing job? Yeah. I mean, I, and uh, I can't complain. I, I'm, I'm lucky to have uh, worked in the, the career that I did and I was, I'm, in luck, I'm lucky to have worked for the companies that I did, but I mean, it was a, it was a long drive into the city every day. And I did that for, you know, 15 years. It was, um, um, it's not always easy selling other people's products for them, giving them advice and watching them not take it. It's, it's it's like any other any other job. It's uh it's a grind and it's something especially if you have a family you ultimately have to you have to do to take care of them and in order to to make a living. But it was it wasn't a super happy period of my life, but it it also wasn't something I look back on miserably. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. <laughs> um, let's find a moment of the opposite frequency. Um, so we've immersed ourselves in a, a moment that would mirror the problem that our persona is experiencing. And so, um, tell me about a time, maybe when you had some more time to spend with your family, you knew your limitations and you were able to both be creative in your, in your publishing and with yourself, but also able to, to be with your, your family. And I know that this is an ups and downs and there's probably little sparkles of this here and there. And, um, when, when was one of the moments and it can be recent, um, where you really, you, you really felt all of these things were lined up and your message was supporting the world and, and you. Well, I think it's right now. And I, I, I can't point to a, a specific day, a specific month or a specific year, but, and like you said, there are ups and downs, but I've finally reached a point in my life where honestly, I'm, I'm happy because there's nothing more that I feel that I need. I mean, there may need, there may be improvements that I feel that I need to make in specific areas of my life. You know, the, the way I um, interact with my family or, or how my business is performing, things that I might want to tweak or make a little bit better. But I honestly, Kyle, there's uh, there's nothing that I feel that I need more of. Um, I don't I don't feel like we need a, a bigger house or or more stuff. Um, 
I, I'm so happy with the people who I have in my life right now. I, I, I don't feel like I need more money. I don't feel like I need more people buying my books or buying my products. Um, and it, it's, it's a good time for me. Uh, I have problems. I, I have uh, difficulties in certain areas of my life. There are things that I do that I want to improve on, but I'm happy. And I, and I found the happiness just comes from realizing that there's not anything more that I really need. I know that's kind of nebulous. I hope that's, that's the kind of answer you're looking for. I can't give you a specific example, but I'm there now. Um, I, I, I think I've anticipated one or found one within, within the threads. Um, thanks. <clears throat> you're welcome. Oh, and we're just on time. This is a lot Did of you... fun, by the way. I, um, this is, uh, this is a really cool experience. You, uh, you're good at this. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. Well, in that case, would you, would you like to hear your story? Oh, heck yeah. I'd never be able to do something like this. I, I can't do it. I'm holding in front of me a plan for a product that over time would ultimately become the thing that I could use to quit my job and pursue a career. This is the perfect idea that I had been waiting for for so long, had been imagining, had been researching and planning, and it was all drawn up, ready to go. And just in this moment, I felt disengaged from it all, that I couldn't do this, that I was too busy, that there were too many other things going on, that the world wasn't set up for me to succeed. I was trying to change a bunch of things that I couldn't. And this one thing that I could change in my life right in front of me, I put into a drawer and go on carrying on with my life, which was comfortable and successful, but not my own and not fulfilling. And a year would pass. I had a good career, but there was a long drive into the city. And on that commute, I would always feel this yearning for more, for more money, for more things. There was always this hunger and this slight discomfort, this need to change that I couldn't quite pin, a, pin out. I was selling other people's products for them and on the grind, missing my family throughout it. And after a year of driving back and forth and commutes, I opened up that drawer again, and I'm not sure what changed in me, but I said I might as well give this a try. I started working on my business, and at the same time, I started taking notes from different Stoic philosophers, learning how to appreciate the things, the, the difference between the things that I could and I couldn't change, learning about how to embody excellence in everything that I did, in my business, how I related to my family, my attitudes, my judgments of the world, and the opinions that I held. And I wanted to expand my sense that I could, I could be able to change the world in any circumstance, no matter how good or bad or dark or confusing things could be. I started to learn how to find the next step forward, no matter what. Now, over the course of many years and a lot of costly and painful mistakes, I would start to weave these notes into stories and into fables that simplified the message, that drove the point home. And over the course of a few years, put together enough to create a publishing company called Stoic Simple, which was dedicated to guiding so many more people on this path to meaning, on this path to agency within their own lives. And it would take a long time, but I realized that I was really on to something, that I had really figured something out. One morning, illustrating a book that I had written when I was 18 years old and spending the whole morning mastering illustrations for it and creating images for words that I had written so long ago that were so deeply meaningful to me. I had created a business and I had created a platform that would allow me to share these words 
and make an impact with them and make a difference in the world that I had always wanted to make. And I can remember sitting there, not a care in the world, happy with what I had, not needing any more houses or cars or anything, but just feeling aligned with my purpose and my lot in life. And that's exactly what I want to teach and share and cultivate in the world with Stoic Simple. Wow. That's, uh, that's amazing that you're very good at what you do. I'm, uh, I'm very impressed. Thank you. Um, now that you've heard this that, was, is this there... was a legitimate pleasure. Thank you so much. Yeah. Is there anywhere where you think sharing something like that would be, uh, useful in helping sell more books or create more connections? I think so. Yeah. In, in fact, uh, simplifying that specific story is it's very helpful helpful for me when it comes to thinking about how i would present some inspiring example of what i've been able to do the last few years to to an audience i mean it's i didn't realize that that story was there until you just told it to me thank you that's that's uh one of the the honors that i have and in many ways it's it's a parallel to what you do of of creating somewhat of a fable It's not exactly like a courtroom truth of exactly what happened, but it brings out and simplifies your truth and your story within your moments and allows you to speak to uh, yourself at a younger age or those that you you really want to reach with these things. Well, I understand the value of what you do now, and I I didn't doubt it before, but um, that was a terrific way to show me and explain to me the the value of what you do. It's uh, it's really amazing, man. Thank you, Phil. It's been an honor. And do you have any closing thoughts for the the audience today? And where can we go to learn more about you and grab some of these books? No closing thoughts. You can go to stoicsimple.com if you'd like to learn more. And if you'd like to buy one of my books, Um, I sell signed copies. Um, And I I just am really happy with with our talk today. Just so impressed. I'm, uh, I'm very impressed with what you do. Awesome. Thanks for letting me be take part in this. Thanks for uh, for choosing me to to be a, a subject of uh, um, of your your storytelling. Game recognizes game. It's it's been my <laughs> pleasure, and thank you so much, Phil, for joining us on the Story Engine Podcast.